I love this word the Lord gave me. Of course, I was in the bathtub when he did it, but <laughs> that's typical of me. You see, if I remember right, I think it was Michelle Pilar that I read on her uh, Facebook page, as a matter of fact, and I even commented on it, and she laughed about it and said something too. But um, I don't know her, so don't get carried away. <laughs> it's just, you know, meet people on the Internet that, hey, you know, if you have a conversation, you don't know the person, you just had a conversation. And if you do that in social media, that doesn't mean you know the person. It just simply means you relate to the person. Big difference. And it's going to come up in this word the Lord gave me of vicarious Christianity or vicarious Christians and transpositional faith. Wonderful words. I love them. But anyways, so I was uh, kind of like, you know, jumping in the bathtub because... Quite frankly, I have, oh man, can I tell you and whine? No, I, really, can I really whine? Oh boy, I'm a male, I know how to whine. You know, just give me half a chance in somebody's ear and I'll whine about it. Well, you know, whine about my issues, not theirs, but my issues are simple, you know. I have arthritis, you know, so I get kind of achy sometimes, you know, not not bad. I mean, I, quite frankly, you know, is uh, if they cut me open again, you know, they'll probably find massive amounts, but... You know, God gets me by. You know, I mean, I deal with it. You know, it's like, I'm okay. You know, if you've ever seen me dance, you'd wonder, he's got arthritis? <laughs> well, you know, that's because I love it. Ah. Of course, the next day after I go dancing, oh, man, I just, oh, I hurt. You know, I just tell my wife, I go, I don't feel good. <laughs> you know, because I don't. But the point is, is that baths, or the bathtub for me, because, no, I'm not one of those rich Christians that has a jacuzzi. <laughs> Well, I sort of do, you know, if you think about it. I could take out these little bubble makers, you know, you know, like the little mat that you put on the side and the little thing that you hang on the side of the bathtub. I found those at a dollar store, you know, well, okay, a used store. I got them for half price, you know, and it was like really cheap, so I bought it because at the time I couldn't walk. My hips were hurting so bad. So I kind of had to go into like a bubble therapy for myself for a while, you know, and got over that. So praise the Lord, I still got them around somewhere, you know, but... I really can't afford a jacuzzi, you know, and probably couldn't put one in my apartment, you know, because it's upstairs anyways. But the point being is that I'm not a person that has a lot of the luxuries, which maybe some people see as necessities, but luxuries of life, you know, that in America we take for granted that other countries would not have, much less use or abuse in some ways that we do as being the most prosperous nation in the world, which we really are comparatively speaking of all the nations and the volume of people. But point being, I'm sitting in the bathtub. And my idea of a mikvah, you know, mikvah? Oh, well, that's a Jewish word for bath, you know, sort of, kind of baptismal. Huh? But anyways, you'll get it. <laughs> Just think about it. So I'm laying in my bathtub, you know, and I'm kind of like thinking about the Lord, you know, as I always do. And sure enough, bing, it's the Lord, Noah. And if you've seen Bing Crosby, you know what's coming next. But no, I, uh, God doesn't speak to me quite that way. He does speak audibly at times. That's not what he did today. But I was just sitting there, you know, and I was kind of like, you know, Lord, I don't, I don't really know what to do next. You know, I've posted devotionals, you know, and I posted some stuff, and I just don't, I said, I'm tired mentally, so I don't feel led yet to really write about, you know, Chosen to Love or some other project I have, you know, or the web pages and the ministries and, you know, a gazillion things that I do, you know, on the internet. But, eh, you know, just didn't feel it. So I'm kind of laying there going, you know, I was like, what do you want to talk about? You know, I said, God, you know, I've read the devotional, and really, you didn't have much to say. Answer, not a word. <laughs> okay. So I got that one. Hmm. So I had no idea what that meant. In my devotionals, it was kind of like, well, you know, it's kind of like, all right, fine, Lord, you know, you can, you're not talking to me or what? Well, then, I was laying there, and I was kind of going, you know, Lord, there's this dumbing down, you know, and I was thinking about men's ministry because I recorded something earlier about it. And this dumbing down, you know, it kept coming to my mind about how people want to simplify words to get downward because I just read some things about people criticizing denominations and attacking religion over relationship and, you know, making up all these weird conflicts that don't exist as far as God's concerned. But, you know, it keeps Christians busy, so if they can stay off of the primacy of, you know, the gospel and preaching the gospel and sharing and caring and developing into disciples, you know, 
Christians do that. They'll do anything else except for develop disciples or preach the gospel. You know, because that's too hard. <laughs> that's tough, man. You got to grow up, you know, in order to do that. But nah, forget that. Let's just go and tear someone down, you know, and kind of stomp around and, you know, look for something to get involved in. And that's what most people do on social media. But as I considered these things, you know, and I'm laying there thinking, you know, man, God, you know, you didn't do any of this junk, you know. <laughs> Who cares about this stuff? You know, it's like all junk and junk and hunk of junk and bunk and baloney. That, you know, I kind of went, you know, Lord, it's, it's like, you know, it's like a mom who wants her daughter to grow up to be a gymnast, you know. Not because the daughter wants to grow up to be a gymnast, but because the mom wants her to grow up to be a gymnast. You know, vicariously living through their children. And I got to thinking about that. Vicariously living through their children. And I thought, ooh, that sounds like vicarious Christians, you know, that I know. You know, they don't live their own faith. They live through someone else's. They live through the accomplishments of others. They live through the church doing something. They live through seeing something on television. They live through posting on the Facebook page or live through some actions that they vicariously project themselves to be as opposed to the reality of who they are in all honesty and fact. And I got to thinking about that because I thought, well, you know, that's kind of like transpositional faith where they're transposing their faith onto something as opposed to faith coming from something into something. You see what I mean? Transpose means you put it on top of. You take it from someplace to put on top of someplace. It's a transpose, not an internal expose or expose. Most of us that are, you know, kind of like spirit-filled, I'm kidding, you know, I don't want to go there. You've got all these people running around going, I'm spirit-filled, I'm a true Christian, I got this, I got that, I got the other thing, and I can, you know, talk it too. Oh, please, you know, I got more than all of you. <laughs> you want to know? Come see me, <laughs> we'll prove it. <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to know, don't go there, trust me. Uh-uh, you know, take you to heaven and back. I'm kidding, sort of, be careful. God might do it to you just to make a point. Kind of wild when he does, too. I'm not telling him. But the bottom line is, transpositional faith would be that which really doesn't come from inside, revealing from inside out who God is, as he said he would be in his people, and so God is in us, which means he should come out of us wherever we are as light. Meaning that we're the light of the world, we're all the earth. Well, that should be God coming out, not Michael coming out. I'm coming out. No, I'm not gay. I'm just coming out. <laughs> oh, well, no, I mean like a Christian, you know, not a gay, but a Christian. Or homosexual. No, not a homosexual. A Christ, you know, like Jesus. Because we don't know what a Christian is anymore, right? <laughs> I mean, I even had Christians during the election telling me that even Mormon's a Christian. No, he's not. <laughs> Sorry. Can't go there. <laughs> eh, wrong. Wrong Jesus. Wrong Christian. But the point being is that coming from within and being revealed without shows and demonstrates to the world who we are what we are and how we are. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I like that. You know? Now, vicarious Christians, they're not quite like that. Because, you see, they're living through others. You know, they're sitting in the pew. You know, kind of like, hey, man, you know what the pastor said? You know what the church said? You know what those people did? You know what the church is doing? You know how this is going? They don't come up to you and say, you know what Jesus told me? You know what God said to me? Do you know what God is doing in my life? You see, that's very transpositional faith. That's kind of like a vicarious faith where you're kind of like talking about others around you. But you're not dealing with ha, numero uno 
you know, the guy that's supposed to be standing bare naked before God one day, exposing his life with all his accomplishments and mistakes. Hmm. Oops. Because you see, a person who's willing to risk nothing gets nothing. A person who's not willing to step out in faith of their own, what little bit Jesus said that they might have had would be taken away. <gasps> They're going to lose their salvation? I don't know. I don't think so, but you know, you never know. God may have. He could easily say they didn't have it in the first place. Because you see, there's always an exclusion for an inclusion of God's scripture being true. Because it says, let God be found faithful and every man be a liar. And I'll have to tell you this, but you know, I've been doing some very interesting research. Very interesting. And all these little doctrines that all these people come up with, you know, eternal security and this kind of thing and that kind of thing, I find out, hey, you know what? It's not that kind of thing. Ooh, it's got an exclusion. God covered it. <gasps> you know, even grace. You know, we get into this age now where, you know, the Jew, let's, let me explain something. The Jew, in all his glory, came to the culmination of everything that you could summate and come to the conclusion of regarding the law. You know, the Torah. And it all ended when Jesus got here. <laughs> Shocked that one up. <laughs> Wrong. Because Jesus came on and said, you know, I know you think you got it all, but you made your traditions bigger than the law. And I'm the lawgiver, and you can't even figure out that I'm the one that was here when I was given the law in the first place. So, if you can't even figure that one out, how could you figure out what you're supposed to be doing? You can't even figure out who I am. So, the bottom line, the law has been going on and accomplishing its purpose up to a point. Sort of, you know, made a society. The society had gotten so backwards. No longer did the law prepare the people to become worshippers of God, but the worshippers of God began to worship the law. So the law became the God. It's not a hard conclusion. If you're Jewish, you know it's true. Yeah. Check it out. What do they kiss? Torah. What do they talk about? Torah. What's the law? There is such a deal. We should study the law day and night and meditate and go from there to here and back and then. And Rabbi so and so says that's Rabbi so and so from this point of view is going to give you that point of view and we're going to get that point of view because in order to build a, a, a nice little hedge around the Torah, we got to protect it and keep it safe so that we can live in society with such a law. Because after all, the law was to make a society of holy people so that we can just worship the law of God, for that is the fulfillment of the law, to worship the law. And that's how we worship God. No. Eh, wrong. Jesus said, no, you don't get it. That's not the point. <laughs> You're just not catching it. Now, in these latter days, because we already kind of like, you know, we got that down. Okay, fine, we got the law down, man. Those Jews, they didn't know what they were doing. They're like, oh, stupid. Of course not. You know, here Jesus comes along, they didn't recognize it, they didn't get it. You know, they didn't understand it's not about the law, the law is to make you feel guilty. Fine. Gotcha. But, you know, I kind of went, let me see very carefully. Now we got grace. We had the law. The Jews thought they had it all. They made a mistake. This is the Messiah. Who? Who? Gone. Jesus warns us. Jesus tells us. Jesus gives us these things. And now, grace is telling us, oh, there's no hell. What? Grace tells us that we can, you know, be assured that we have our salvation and that grace will accomplish all things. And that because we're grace of the saved, we can, you know, like have that assurance that guess what? God wouldn't condemn anyone because he's going to save everyone because of grace. Because they're already saved because grace was already given. And grace is a fact accompli as opposed to a process accomplishing and never mind about who has to extend that grace to you because of the work that has been done by the son in giving to you that opportunity to have grace extended to you is that why they should not perish or does it say would not perish see some people reword it real quick they say would not or should not Big difference. Should not is the fact that you could still make a kind of like a 
distinction. But would not is the fact that there's no distinction. You automatically get saved. Hmm, that's John 3.16, kind of like reworded with an S or a W. Hmm, <laughs> well, you see, that's kind of where straining at a gnat and swallowing a f camel is what Jews did with the law. I think we kind of got that way with grace a little bit. Kind of beginning to mess it up pretty good. It's beginning to look like pharisaical grace and Sadducean grace. Now, I'm not going to try to explain to you what that means, because guess what? You'd have to understand what a Pharisee is and a Sadducee, and it's not because they're Sadducee, and it's not because they were Pharisee, because they're actually Pushim and Pushi, but, you know, we won't get into Hebrew. But the point being is this. If a Jew could mess it up, can a Christian mess it up? Yeah, easily, by objectifying as opposed to personifying. You see, the law personified is Jesus. Grace personified is Jesus. Jesus is both. Jesus is the fulfillment of all from cover to cover. He's kind of like the left and the right hand of God because he's son of God and he sits at the right hand of the Father. So, people can easily kind of get off on the left and be off or get off on the right and be off and quite frankly, if you looked at Christians today, you could find a lot of legalists and you can find a lot of gracialists, so to speak. Gracialist, <laughs> gracist, and some gracist, you know, that are out there that are too much grace, and some legalists that are too much legal, and somewhere in between, you and I got to figure out what are we doing? Well, it's relational. God applies it according to our perspective of knowing Him in a personal, intimate way as He relates it to us by His Holy Spirit. You're not going to know it all to begin with. You're going to grow it all as you learn of him. In other words, it's going to grow up inside you as a sapling, as a germination of a thought and an idea. And as it grows, it'll become like a seed that you know blossoms. And you know what a blossom looks like? Yeah, it's beautiful, smells good and everything else. But guess what? That blossom is supposed to turn into fruit. It doesn't just blossom. No, it's supposed to turn into a fruit. You call me a fruit? <laughs> Hey, at least you're not nuts. <laughs> but a fruit, you know, fruit loops. No, okay, fruit juice. But as we are developed, that's where you kind of find, okay, so these people kind of made this mistake and those people made that mistake. How can we learn from both mistakes? And it's not about being and walking in the middle, but it's finding God in the midst of it. Because God in the midst of his people is what was it all about in the first place. In order to approach God, he habitated with the tabernacle in the midst of his people, and in order to come near unto him, they had to obey the law. In grace, in order to come near unto God into heaven, we have to obey the law of grace, which is to have it appropriated to us by way of asking or accepting the work of salvation that Jesus has provided for us so that we would have access to the Father in order to receive what? Grace and mercy. <gasps> oh, so do we automatically get it? Well, you see, if you objectify grace, you think you got it. If you personify grace, you still know that God's got to give it to you. Because <laughs> it's kind of like both at the same time. It's a time frame, time sequence thing that you're going to get all confused about. Because if you try to work it out to just use it, to abuse it, God's going to use an exclusion and get you covered. Because guess what? If you abuse grace, you'll see there's an exception you never had in the first place. You just thought you did. Hmm. Hmm. But if you use it, meaning that you accept it as what God has done and God is doing and God will accomplish because that which was, is, and ever shall be, well then, it's working in order to process in you and then the Holy Spirit is kind of like, you know, made it real and it's applicable and in heaven there's no time, so it's internal now, it's already accomplished and so it'll be accomplished in you as you go through this time frame and you step out of this dimension into the reality of no time frame so that there'll always be that constant awareness that you already have it, even though you didn't know you had it while you were still here in this time frame because you were still going forward in order to get it, which we already had accomplished by what was in the past, but it'll all be fulfilled because it's what was and is and never shall be, so it'll be all completed in another dimension. <laughs> Whoops! In the meantime, do you got it? Well, yeah. Kinda. You know, as far as you're concerned. Yeah. But if you abuse it, do you got it? No. 
but if you use it, do you got it? Well, if you let God work out your salvation from within to without, then you'll find that from without to within, you got it. Get it? Yeah, if you don't understand that, don't worry. I'm famous for having people go, huh? Well, you know, me and Chuck Missler, you know, we used to talk. <laughs> Such a deal! Oi! <laughs> I didn't have any problem following what he was saying. I didn't have to replay the tapes. I got it the first time. <laughs> it was interesting. Very interesting, Chuck. What's that you say? Oh, very good. You wise man. But I didn't have to go to the mountaintop in order to find it. You know, God opens up the ears and eyes and understanding and enlightens our hearts as we seek Him and let Him to lead us. And that's kind of why I found myself looking at, in these last days, vicarious Christians. You didn't, you, you didn't know I was going there? You mean you didn't see it coming? You know, all that was just to lead up to vicarious Christians? Boy, that guy's sharp. He stayed right on track or tack or kind of went around the circle and came back to the original point. I'll never say. Where's my notes? There aren't any. It's just the words written down. Like I said, I got them in the bathtub. What do you think I'm going to do? Make a dissertation out of a long explanation in order to get to the place of a outline? You know, I know a lot of you people like outlines. God help you. <laughs> I like inspiration. <laughs> I'm really way out there in the field or right field or some field of dreams. But... My point is, vicarious Christians aren't living the reality of Jesus. They presume, because they are involved in the crowd of feeling, that they are saved. They have the feeling. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I, I said it, you know. I, I prayed it, you know, and I, I got it. I'm sure I do, you know. I just really can't tell you much about it because it's just kind of like, it's there, you know. I believe it. I swear I... I pledge to do my best to do my duty to God and country or something like that. I can't even remember the council. Three, two, one? I don't know. One. I like the one. But the point is, is in these swearing things, hey, faith is not about I believe. Faith is knowing who you believe in and what you believe in and why you believe in it and how you believe in it because guess what? That's what God is doing inside you and you already know it because you're growing in it. But you see, a vicarious Christian is someone who hasn't grown, hasn't developed, hasn't moved on. As a matter of fact, they're not just like a baby Christian sitting in a crib like Chuck Smith used to say and you know, the only thing they've learned in their Christian walk is da da, goo goo, baby, wah wah, feed me. They aren't a Christian in the first place. And that's the scary part. Because vicarious Christianity is living through the faith of someone else, transpositional faith. It's assuming you're saved because of someone else. Vicarious Christianity was used in denominationalism a lot because the ceremony was the confirmation of the reality, supposedly, of a relationship with God. If someone sprinkled water on you, you were baptized Catholic. If someone, you know, took you through a catechism, you were a Catholic. If someone said, you know, the right teaching to you, you were confirmed as a Catholic. If you went through your first communion, you were a Catholic. And so, automatically, if you went through all those things of the Catholic faith, you're a Christian. That's transpositional faith. You see, most Catholics I know, they haven't a clue what God's all about. They say, well, yeah, I went to my catechism. I don't know what it said. The same way that Jews go through their process of tradition without there being any realization of God. Most Jews I met, even in Orthodoxy, don't believe in God. Okay, not most Jews. Of the Jews that I met, there's a lot of Jews in Orthodoxy that don't believe in God. And I read of others a lot that don't believe in God. They believe in the philosophy of God. They believe in the idea that, you know, the creative process of God in us is God, us, all of us, projecting into this ether existential way of creating the form of God by all of us together being as God and you know, proving that there is a God, 
you know, that he would speak by the collective consciousness of us all in some way. And it gets really weird, you know. And then there are other sects of Judaism that do other things, you know, that are kind of like just as weird. Because the same way happens in Christianity, too. There are people that really don't have a personal relationship. They get away with the religion of relationship. The religion of relationship says, well, you know, I should read my Bible. So I read my Bible, that means I'm a Christian. Or I talk about Jesus, so that means that I'm a Christian. Or I, I believe, you know, but that means I'm a Christian. Well, no, it doesn't. You see, the only thing that really qualifies a Christian as being a Christian is God. God says so. Bottom line, I mean, you know, you know I can't tell what you are. You know, I can, I can see the fruit, you know, loops. You know, I can see the fruit tree, you know. I can see the fruit from the nuts, you know. That I can do. I can see leaves, I can see blossoms, I can see all these other things. But I'll be honest with you, you know, even though I know about assurance of salvation and I can recognize a certain amount of assurance that I have that I know that I'm saved, unless I have a relationship and I've been talking to God, I'm not so sure about that assurance. Because Paul said, even in his own letters, lest I be a castaway, you know, at the end of my life, having spent my life preaching the gospel, that he would not want to be considered a castaway, but that he would rather have to present to the Lord, you know, the glory of the fruit of the people that he was writing to and the, you know, witness of the testimony of Jesus Christ, that he was faithful even unto death, you know, in the salvation of those. And then later on in his life, in another letter, he wrote that, you know, he had finished his course, he had run the race, there was laid up for him a treasure in heaven. So, you know, he already knew, but he was using it as a demonstration to those that he was writing to that they needed to reconsider their point of reference of their own salvation because he didn't want to negate grace he wanted it to be confirmed by the actions of grace and the actions of grace are the working out not the works of but the working out your salvation with fear and trembling knowing full well that God is the one who determines your salvation not us standing here telling you hey by grace you're saved and guess what you just got to say you know amen thank you God you know and four spiritual laws and you know I came forward and bingo I got it now I'm just going to sit in the pew and wait for the Lord to return. It's called vicarious Christianity. It existed in the Catholic Church and the early Christians, some. It existed in the Protestant Reformation. It exists in every type of formation where you put a congregation together without the individuality of the expression of each and every one of us before God making a declaration of who we are and what God is doing in our life. That, my friend, is your testimony. What's your testimony today? Has God spoken to you? If God's never spoken to you, I'd re-examine something. First, I'd re-examine my theology. <laughs> Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they will not follow the voice of another. And I figure the voice is a voice, you know, and it's like, if you watch a television program called The Voice, I don't think they're putting written text up there. <laughs> Maybe I'm stupid, but I just figure a certain amount of literalism is literal. A certain amount of figuratism is figurative. If it says it's figurative, it's figurative. If it doesn't say it's figurative, it's not figurative. It's literal. When God says, I am speaking, I figure he's speaking. Call me stupid, but that's the way I figure it. Speaking means speaking. Hearing means hearing. Reading means reading. Studying means studying. Hey, study shows that's some fruit. Work when you have a check right away, word of truth. Bingo. Check that one off. But my point is, if you aren't, developing a personal relationship with God in some way, I mean somehow, some purpose, first of all, I'd go find somebody that has one and work with them to get one, you know? I mean, quite frankly, you know, I'm listening to some people talking about, you know, what they need to do, you know, as men of God, I'm thinking, well, first, check and see if they're saved. <laughs> Hello? You know, I mean, it's nice to think that just because you did the good works, they're saved. Judas did some wonderful works. Judas went a long ways down the road of discipleship <laughs> until the night he was betrayed. And then revealed, Judas revealed what kind of disciple he was. I don't want to be found to be that kind of disciple. 
I don't want to be found the betrayer of my faith or my grace that I've been given, but rather I want to be the perfect example of someone who struggled, strived, and worked. And as the pastor that I was recently listening to was teaching, abandoning myself and emptying myself of myself so that I would be appropriating Jesus in me so that God in me would be alive and I would no longer be living but God liveth in me with Christ that I don't live live by the will of the Son of God who gave himself for me and I'm going to do it. You know the routine. If you don't, trust me. If you want me to regurgitate it, I'll regurgitate it. Oh. <laughs> you know, but uh, you, know, you got it, you know, basically. Jesus in you, the hope of glory. God coming out of you is the salvation. If you aren't speaking and talking and raging you know, and relating, you know, what God has done to you, in you, and with you, and changing you, I'm not sure you're saved. You might be sure. I'm not so sure. You may need to check it. Check it out at the door, or check it in with God, one of the two, because, frankly, you might be wasting your time by being a vicarious Christian with transpositional faith, just simply feeling kumbaya. And I know what that's like. You know, I used to go when I before I got saved. I went four times, fourth time I got saved, three times, to check out what they were doing. I saw these people having the kumbaya moment. You know, they were all like, "We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord." You know, like dump down, turn around, touch ground, save my Lord. You know, and like shake a hand and shake a hand next to you. You know, if you'd never seen that before, it was a kumbaya moment. I felt wonderful. I felt special. I felt loved. You know, kumbaya, Kodak moment. But I wasn't saved, <laughs> but I was watching how to get saved, and once they'd done it enough times, I decided to get saved. Sadly, <laughs> gladly, both at the same time, <laughs> and madly in love, I got saved, you know, um, emotionally, <laughs> meaning that, okay, here was Michael, there's no doubt about what this was the next day, <laughs> or the next second that I opened my eyes. <laughs> It was this type of person dead. It was this type of person alive. There was no doubt about it. All the feelings were completely different, as well as the eyesight, the ear sight, the nose sight, the, well, spiritual sight, and insight. Man, did I get one of those kind of experiences. And I thought everybody got that. It took me almost 20 years to figure out. Not everyone got that, you know? And I used to say, well, I'm spoiled. I kept it pretty hidden, but you know, because I didn't want to be accountable. But you know, I'm pretty spoiled with what I got, <laughs> even though I nearly died for it. You know, I mean, you, you, if you get wonderful experiences with God, you know, like kind of like really cool, you know, like interpersonal miracles and all kinds of weird things, you get some real heavy duty trials and tribulations too, some real challenges. You get some Abraham stuff that's gonna drive you crazy, David stuff. Oh boy, you know, kind of like. Uh, lot. <laughs> well, you know, you're going to live out the Word of God is what you're going to do. So, vicarious Christians aren't doing really what God said He would do with all Christians. Make a living Bible out of you. A living example of who He is in the flesh as He works out through you daily in your routine of life. You aren't a Christian Christ likeness you are a religious Christian as a vicarious working through a transpositional faith and frankly that scares me because I don't want to see anyone go to hell I want to see everyone have faith the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not yet seen I want to see everyone have eternal life which is to know him and know him who sent him. Meaning that you know God, my Father, and you know Jesus, His Son, my friend, my brother, my Lord, and my God. Because if you don't, if you aren't confident and assured of that, for God's sake, stop what you're doing and get real. Find someone who has a relationship, develop it with them. Say, I don't got what they got, I want what they got, and I want to have it because I don't want to be assured or I don't want to be less assured than what I just got 
not assured of what I think I am assured of, which was really not what I was so sure of because I could actually be challenged by it, and now I'm beginning to doubt that I really have it because it was vicarious transpositional faith, and I'm thinking I'm a vicarious Christian, and oh my God, I don't want to be. Well, good. Don't be. Don't have transpositional faith. Don't live on someone else's accomplishments. Don't live by anyone else's miracles. Don't live by anything else. Don't suddenly get the gift of tongues because you watched it on television. Transpositional faith. Don't suddenly get you know, some kind of faith experience because you heard your pastor say it. Transpositional faith. Don't get misled by trying to think that you know, experiential faith is something wrong when you can ground it in the Word of God. Because everything that's in the Word of God Men and women of God wrote as they were inspired of their experiences that they went through. Now, experiential faith as a false doctrine is, you know, kind of a false doctrine, and it's kind of like weird, but, you know, we will separate that some other time and place because we're talking about transpositional faith, not experiential doctrine. But if you aren't experiencing God in a personal, intimate way, What do you do? Really? Is it all about feelings? Just because you can feel good in a worship service? Is it about what you're getting because you happen to be splashed on by someone else who has faith or laid hands on you or prayed for you because you went forward? When the music fades and everyone steps away and it gets dark and lonely and the spotlight comes on you do you have faith? do you have Jesus? do you have God in your life? do you know him? does he know you? I've been there and I have the Lord but I've been where God leaves you all alone. And it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. But it's a scarier thing and a more terrifying moment when you feel as though God is not there. Do you have real Jesus in you? Because if you don't, it's time to get him. It's time to get with all you're getting. It's time to give with all your giving. It's time to follow with all your following. And it's time to do whatever it takes to make that assurance of salvation real in your life. That you have a personal relationship that will take you not just to a rapture, but should it be that God decides that you do not go, that it will take you to the realization that you might die for your faith and that you're willing to suffer the loss of all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ even unto his suffering and his death, that you might be one of those that God has called to overcome by your testimony, by the word of the Lord, and by loving not your life even unto death. Do you have that kind of relationship today? Ask God for God's sake. Because God's witness to you is He wants you to have that. Because He already proved it in His Son. And His Son had to die also. And so will you to yourself in order to gain God. If you don't want God like that, walk away. Because you're going to hell. But if you do want God, get down on your knees and pray. And then go out and seek every way possible to find Him. Because God will be found by those who seek Him with all of their heart. God will be found if you just cry out to Him. God will be found if you just want Him more than anything else in your life. I know. Those three nights I went and watched, the last night, on the fourth night, when I thought I was being taken to church in order to make a commitment to Jesus, or go forward, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't get picked up. And I felt like my world had ended. I felt like that it was the end of the world and I was 
I didn't think I was going to hell, but it was just the end. I was so, so dark, so, so all alone, so lonely. I ran out the house. I ran down the street. I ran for about a mile. And then I cast myself and threw myself down on the grass and cried and begged and pleaded that if there was a God, that he would take me to church. That's what I figured I needed to do. I had to do it that way because I didn't know any other way. I'd never been raised in any religion. But God knows that fifth week, because it was five weeks in a row because I missed the fourth one, but that fifth week when I got offered, I begged and pleaded with that guy to go and I was like so thrilled to get there that I ran for it when it was time. And I wanted God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And of course, He did something different, took me in the back and prayed, but oh well. You need to. If it means you got to change, change. If it means you got to get it, get it. Whatever it takes, you go for it. Because vicarious faith will not save you, transpositional faith will not save you, being a Christian sitting in a pew will not save you. Hanging out with a bunch of guys who look like they're having fun, you know, just because you're doing the thing that sounds Christian, won't get it. It doesn't cut it when it comes to Jesus. If he says, depart from me, I never knew you. I'm sorry, that is one of the exclusions that you're going to find. That there might be a debate with some people, but I'm telling you straight from the Word of God. When God says, depart from me, I never knew you, you're not saved. And those that are departed from, God is not saving. He left that in there for a very specific purpose and very specific people that need to be warned and told that grace you can be saved when God extends his scepter to you of mercy and he reaches out to you with his hand of love and he says to you, come unto me. Anyone that would be thirsty, come unto me. Anyone that desires to know me, come unto me. Anyone that wants to be with me, come. For the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and you will not be rejected. But come to me. Know me. Walk with me. Talk with me. I hope you're not vicarious. Because it's not hilarious. <laughs> A vicarious Christian will go to hell because they didn't have Jesus in the first place. They looked like it. They talked like it. They walked like it. They weren't wolves in sheep's clothing. They were just sheep being herded to the slaughter and never once developing a personal relationship with Jesus, no matter what pen they were found in. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. Humble yourself today and ask God to lead you to the place where you will know Him in a more personal and intimate way than you've ever known Him before.